Hi, Melissa. Thank you very much for joining me um, on this lovely Friday, cup of tea Friday, having a little catch up about what's been going on, um, going on this week, what's been going on in the world of aces and trauma. Um, so yes, I wonder, could you please just explain to people um, who you are and how we know each other? Yes, yeah, so uh, first of all, Lisa, with it being International Women's Day, I mean, we couldn't have picked a better day to be actually having this um, discussion. Um, so I'm Mel Berry. Um, I've worked across the whole of the UK in the sports sector, and um, I'm really interested in my both professional and personal side of ACEs and trauma, as I said, from my own lived experience, um, and particularly actually how sport could be a way of supporting people on that journey and um, I've had the fortunate uh, um, chance of listening to you Lisa over Twitter um, I met you with um, the Thrive model which Dr Molly Marty uh, came over and spoke about which was brilliant because I got to meet you in person and um, now I'm here speaking to you uh, on your YouTube channel. Which is brilliant. And I'm really excited that we're having this conversation because um, there are so many kind of elements and aspects to thinking about ACEs and trauma and where we're all on that, where we all are on that journey. And you're located in Wales, aren't you? Yep. Yeah. Lovely part of the world. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Um, and I know that Wales is very keen to um, really get into a... Uh, strong aces aware agenda in in perhaps a similar way that Scotland has is that um, right yeah yeah I mean certainly I think Scotland are probably um, I'm having worked up there as well are uh, a bit more in front of us um, with that and certainly yeah we're trying to spread aces through all the different sectors um, what has that come to the sports sector just generally even within Scotland or England or Wales, not yet. And for me, that's certainly um, an area where, as I said, from personal experience, I've gained so much from. Um, but sport doesn't necessarily, as it stands, position itself where it can actually help aces and trauma, I guess, the way in which perhaps you and I see it. Yeah. And, and I think what really interested me about speaking to you was really starting to think about i mean first of all it's your interest in bruce perry's neurosequential model which i want you to tell us because uh, you're working with bruce on this aren't you so i want you to tell us um a little bit about that in a minute but one of the things that i'm really interested in is where we as individuals are located in our recovery journey and um you will know that i there's a there's a video in wales that is about aces um, that I have quite a strong reaction to and don't <laughs> like at all. Um, and that's largely because the child uh, who then becomes the adult um, is not really located in, in the experience of healing and recovery and, 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 and is quite dependent upon all his dysfunctions, this, this poor child, all his dysfunctions come from his parents, which means that... Um, all people who have dysfunctions it's their parents fault which is a kind of strange um uh, old story um and then when when he is actually okay in the latter part of the film that's down to professionals and experts and 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 he's not really located in that but if we understand child development then we know that we have we are growing and building all the time in our in are not just with the interactions that we have and all of our relational experiences but also there's an aspect of who we are within that and and i often think that that aspect is missing um in the aces story and one of the reasons i felt so sort of compelled to have a chat with you is because you clearly locate yourself as someone who steered very clear of um uh services in terms of your own healing journey um however i put it to you that your relationship with sport was actually your healer 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I totally um, agree with you in terms of, I guess it's important in whatever we do with bases and traumas, really put in those with experience, whether it's a young child or whether it's if you're working within different sectors, whoever that is, that they are part of that conversation. And when I talk about co-creation, I talk about that being done with... Um, not done with alongside those who've had those experiences because you can never truly understand what that experience might be. And this is different for everyone that's gone through a journey, but mm. actually they need to be part of it because it's hard to really understand and get underneath um, the behaviors, what you see if you don't. Um, now, absolutely, um, with sport for me, certainly, um, I guess from a very young age, uh, I would say I used sport as my starting point for healing. Now, back then, I wouldn't have known. At five or six, you don't know that actually I'm going to go into support and into sport, and that's what's going to um, help me on my journey. But mm. for me, sport was that safe place. Um, it was a place I felt myself, and actually, it allowed me to build a positive relational health subconsciously so it wasn't you know going into a service um at that time i didn't um i guess tell my story and it's not been i've not told my story but the challenge that i've had with going with services is that you might straight away get labels stuck on you um and i felt i didn't actually need that journey because through sport i built my relational health and um, my relational um, positive relational health up but also it supported me I feel knowing what I do now about neurosequential development that it helped me to my educational journey um, but those relationships weren't done um, consciously and for me I do think that we've got a part, a part where we don't necessarily need all services um, to support people on their journey or maybe I might take that into a different direction and think about how much is it about opportunity and actually by having opportunities in communities, whether that's sport, music, um, drama, all of those things for people to access that in a, in a, in a sense, there's a, there's a, an informal intervention that's occurring where it's needed. And that that's been one of the, the greatest, uh, despairing factors for me in terms of community and um our society and what we in terms of austerity um and, and i hate the word austerity because it makes it sound like something that we we had to have you know uh whereas actually there's we clearly didn't um lots of money everywhere else um but <laughs> you know the, the that impact of austerity has reduced those what we might term informal interventions and and if we think about your relationship with sport and how that was part of your healing journey um that's an informal um intervention not least because you didn't it wasn't meant to be an intervention you were just doing sport but of course that segues really nicely into bruce perry's neuro sequential model um i, I was literally just about to say i mean bruce speaks a lot about constructing um, relational health and you know in, in that way um, besides the neurological uh, neurosequential development that is about actually sometimes as you said within our communities we might have to try to put informal interventions in um, place so again um, opportunity for me is massive particularly when you look at different demographics um, if we don't have those opportunities um, available, we've got no chance of even looking at constructing informal um, interventions because there's nothing in place to allow that to happen. Um, but yes, yeah, so the neurosequential model of sport is really, in, is really interesting. Um, and Bruce is obviously a guru and his team are doing work within the, um, within the education uh, system. And earlier this year, actually in January, um, I found within the USA and um, 
Megan Bartlett. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been uh, implementing a new sequential model for sport. So as you can imagine, being from a sports background and learning more about, I guess, the architecture of the, of the brain, um, I got in contact with Bruce um, and his team just said, look, this is something I really want to explore. And certainly within, from a personal point of view, the journey that I've been um, on through sports, both to an, an elite level and grassroots level, is something that I wanted to um, explore more. And that, again, that's about giving people knowledge and understanding of what ACEs and trauma and how they come together. Mm -hmm. um, again, the different stages of the brain, but how, how we deliver our sport and can we deliver it in a way that takes us through the stages of the um, brain mm -hmm. and can, can give us different parts um, that make us feel safe, that makes us feel regulated and actually use sport for healing. We position sport a lot these days that it's just taken it as a given. If you take part in sport, it's going to help your mental health. If you take part in sport, it's going to help social uh, and emotional well-being. Mm. But actually, we can say that, but as a sector, do we understand it? Do we understand it in the context of uh, working with those who had, adverse, had adversities? Um, and in my opinion right now, we don't. But mm. I'll tell you what, if we do that, and in the right way, God, think about how many people and communities we can really, really support. I mean, I'm excited about uh, just talking about it. I'm excited listening about it. I mean, you know, that was one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you because for those, for those people watching that don't know about Bruce Perry's neurosequential model, and I would definitely recommend looking up about it, it's, it's based on the understanding that the brain develops and grows from the bottom up. So from the brain stem up all the way to our prefrontal cortex um, and the the upper part of the brain is mat matures around 25 to 30. So uh, around thinking about early developmental childhood trauma, um, Bruce uh, is able to acknowledge that that takes place as the brainstem and the lower part of the brain are developing, depending on where that abuse happens or where that trauma, because uh, it's obviously trauma isn't always about abuse, but where, where the trauma occurs and that it gets stuck in that place and so the best way to um, think about healing from trauma is working from the brain up um, and, and starting with where something is trapped so that that's that's my very very brief understanding to share with you about the neurosequential model um, but there are some uh, great resources online that will help you understand that better and I will pop those into the comments underneath would you add anything to that? Um, no, I'm, I mean, I, you know, one of the main things for me as well is just thinking about that, yes, actually, whilst your brain develops uh, sequentially, that actually can never stop. So, you know, right through to the age of um, 100, if you've been impacted at every part um, of your learning um, journey, that that we can change the way in which our brain circuits have been um strengthened or um, weakened and for me that's even the you know that's the important part because yes a lot of Bruce's work is with um, children and young people but this can be taken and just used for many different adults um, that have experienced the same thing and for me when we're looking at supporting and, and having an environment communities which are ready for the future generation, actually it's about working with the generations that we've got now, those are the um, adults as well as the children, because they're the ones that are going to have the next generation. Um, and, mm. you know, again, that's where I see such a huge impact that can be, yes, I'm going to say through the sports um, sector, because that's, that's where my passion is. But for me, you know, I'm sure Lisa, you've seen as well, with your work with adults in this area, the difference and the potential and just seeing them go, oh my God, I can, I can achieve, I can mm -hmm. learn is 
Melissa. It's that is magical. It is absolutely magical. It really is. And, and, you know, I'm often found wandering around my training room when I'm delivering training saying, you know, and you're never going to believe this. We have plasticity, you know, the, the whole... <laughs> It's so sexy, you know, and people kind of look at me like that's interesting. Um, but, you know, that that I think that understanding, I mean, and I know that we have plasticity. I feel it. I didn't, you know, the fact that there's a science that tells us we have plasticity is, is very exciting. But actually, um, I'm of, a, of an age now where I've been around enough people to understand that we change with the right uh, interrelated experiences and connections uh, we change and we change that internal architecture and we can change those inner beliefs and we can change the narratives that we have, um, providing that we can be around the right environments to support altering those narratives. So, you know, if I, for me, if I'm working with children, I'm working with the adults. I, in the 90s and, uh, you know, when I was doing a lot of work in schools and with individual children, one-to-one -one work, it always baffled me that I was just working with this child. I wasn't doing anything with the school. I wasn't doing anything with the parents. I wasn't connected to the community. We worked in these little strange silos. And I'm, I'm glad that we've kind of moving out of of that into something far more sophisticated that that represents the sophistication of the human um but we're not there yet we're not there yet no um but like what you said as individuals and as countries when i look at the uk we're we're on that journey somewhere and you know as we're all on a journey somewhere and i think it's just for me the main thing is you have to keep at the center of all of this wherever the aces trauma um agenda goes let's make sure we keep the people that we want to impact and support at at the center and at the heart of it and not just saying it you know i know you and i speak all the time it's like you hear all these lingos and, and child uh, focus and people focus um but there's a huge difference about saying it and actually um um applying that um, it's phenomenal it's yeah it's phenomenal and and the whole the whole week's conversation on twitter because that's where i kind of reside most of the time has been very much about that uh lived experience the intersection between our professional and our personal how we show up you know whether we know we're showing up with all of our stuff or not we are so we may as well develop our awareness about that so that we can meet people as deeply as we're meeting ourselves um but yeah i think we're not there yet and services that are created without having communities um voices different voices of, of different experiences at the heart of those service creations that's not co-creating you know mm -hmm. talking to other services is not co-creation that's called multi-agency working and we should be doing that anyway um, so yeah, so uh, I have quite strong views about that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're all working at it. And I think we're in a very different climate than we've been in before. And I think that might be something to do with social media, uh, because we're all quite um, noisy now. And I think people, I certainly feel safer about my personal stuff because I work for myself um, and in fact I wouldn't say I feel safe I feel safe about that um, but I've worked in environments where I don't and that's what we need to shift we need to shift I think that sense that somehow people with certain experiences and professionals are two entirely different things because that, that's not the way that it is but if people aren't safe to be able to talk about that then we're never going to have that voice running through every element of a service, you know, being on every level involved in, in, in that creation of that service and delivery. Yeah, I 100% agree with all that. And certainly, you know, I think when we talk about services or even when I talk about sector, so if I take the sports sector, um, it is... Um, not safe i would say if you were, were if you're working in the sports sector if you're an if you're an athlete you know just take mental health just to say that perhaps 
um, your own stories. Um, it, to say that, I don't think at the moment it's a safe space to be able to do that because people will label, they will judge, they might think, well, their performance from an athlete's point of view isn't going to be up to standard because of that. But actually, what we know is if we support that social and emotional well-being, like learning, your performance will get better and it will enhance your performance. But actually, because perhaps from my sector specifically don't understand that, there's still that barrier um, about being safe to go, actually, I've got someone, um, I've been someone with that experience, or am I allowed to be vulnerable? Um, like I said, for me, I'm at a point, stage in my life where I'm quite happy and comfortable to say that um not many other people would be yeah well melissa i've really loved speaking to you and i'm going to watch with bated breath how your work goes with bruce in terms of bringing together the neurosequential model and sport in terms of healing and recovery and all of that it's exciting it's innovative it's creative it's everything i would expect um from a project in that sense. So I'm gonna be watching how that goes on and maybe we can check in again in a few months and see how that's moved forward and how you've been able to work with that. Brilliant, thanks very much for your time today, Lisa. Thank you very much, you take care. Bye. Bye.